Let's bow our heads for a little prayer. Father God, we come before you. We want to thank you. Father, we praise you, Lord, that you're the God who fed the 5,000. Out of the five loaves and the two fish, out of the few that your people had, you're able to feed 5,000 men. And in addition to that, women and children. Father, we praise you, Lord, that you're the God who's all sufficient, that you have all things and you have all power. And you're sovereign and you do so for the good of your people. And Father, we come before you and we claim that great promise today. Father, because we don't know what this week will bring. Father, as we come, Lord, we have heard news about um, the COVID-19. We hear news about unrest. We hear news about changes of our economy. Lord, your people were filled with fear. And Father, remind us once again, Lord, that you're the God who supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. Christ Jesus. Lord, it's not just your riches, but your riches in glory and out of that abundance you supply all the need for your people. And so, Lord, we come before you today, Lord. For those of us who are anxious heart, weighted down by maybe financial needs or by a decision we need to make by the needs of our families, by the needs of um, parenting, by the needs of teachings and schooling. Father, we come before you, Lord, we lift all of those needs up to you. Father, we thank you that you're the great shepherd and the shepherd of our soul. We thank you that you hear our prayers. And we thank you that whatever problems is out there is not big enough to and that you stoop down to hear our prayers and we come before you today. And Father, we thank you too as well for what you that you commissioned your church to proclaim the wonderful news of power and authority that you have given, that the kingdom of God is here, and that your son in his death and resurrection and being raised on high has ushered in this amazing new kingdom. Father, we pray the Lord that this week, the reality of that and that is Forgive us, Lord, for our fears, for our doubts, for our lack of trust. Father, you know our hearts. You know that though we're little hearts, and though you often review your disciples, you still love them and you take them and you challenge them. And Father, we pray that you would do the same to us as well in our hearts. Lord, please, Lord, uh, strengthen us. Uh, we just uh, lift up our knees. Father, I just pray for those who are looking for work or who might be afraid of job security during this time that we live. Father, I thank you for the many young children that we have. We pray for the blessing uh, to their parents. And one day that these wonderful children will cross and call their mom, also their dad. Yes. Father, we just pray that you would um, bless all the little ones. And Lord, and even in this uncertain times, we know that you're the Father who hears and cares for you. And your word says, your angels are watching you. And Father, we thank you we can have that confidence, even at a certain times, Lord. We don't know what will happen. We don't know what tomorrow will hold. We don't know what the end of this year will hold. We don't know um, at the end of this year what the, the new president, new Congress will hold. We know, Lord, that you're the sovereign, 
And Lord, that you're on the throne and nothing will change that. We thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, as we open your word now, you will please speak to us during this time. And we just um, want to pray um, that you will continue to powerfully work with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Could I ask the Lord, please stand up? Let's recite the prayer of the Lord Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bible, please open to Luke chapter 9. We're starting our passage this morning on the sending out of the 12. Now, on the surface level, when you look at these three, basically there are three episodes. This Jesus sending out the 12, what happened to uh, what Herod's reaction the feeding of 5,000, they seem like they're individual stories. In a sense, they do. But they're actually tied together, really, by one theme. And this is a theme that Luke develops throughout his book. And you can see that because Luke wrote the second installment of his gospel, which is the Acts of the Apostles. And what he's focusing on in Acts, and also what he's developing in the Gospel of Luke, is the power and the authority given to the apostles and given to the disciples to take the news, good news of the kingdom to the ends of the world. And this is by extension what God's designed, what Jesus designed for his disciples. And I hope that as we go through these three stories and we will do really in a sense a very short survey of each one of them that how they are actually tied to the power to the authority that Jesus actually gave to his, to his people now I don't know if you oftentimes when you think about what it means to be a Christian the words authority the words power will rather they come to Perhaps not. Maybe your description of what a Christian is is oftentimes nice is the word that comes to mind, or kind, or loving. Those things are all important. But I think one of the most neglected aspects of Christian discipleship is the power and the authority that God has given. Jesus has commissioned to Christians to go out and preach the great gospel of the community. You and I have a mission given by Jesus himself. In whatever vocation he has called you to go, in whatever area he has called you to serve, you have a place in that sphere to represent the power and the authority of God's kingdom. And this is what this passage here tells us. And I hope to share with you this is his call for us. Let's look at this passage. First of all, what he does here is he called the 12 together and give them power and authority over all demons and cure to cure diseases. Now, the first thing I want just want to emphasize is that it's the fact that he called the 12. Now, why 12? Because the 12 actually represents the people of God. In the Old Testament, there are 12 tribes. In the New Testament here, there's a, the 12 disciples. In a sense, he's commissioning the new people of God. It's new in a sense because he's calling them out of the Jewish people at the time. And in fact, he's doing something new because he's not calling them from the religious school, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, most of them were not educated. 
But he was calling them to himself because he has a new mission. But in a sense, this is a continuation of God's what God has been doing throughout the history of the world because it's what? It's number 12. He's still calling the 12. And what he's called them to do is he gave them power and authority over all demons and cure diseases. Now, Christians differ today as far as what the extent of that power, what the extent of that authority is. And we as Christians, we can differ in some ways. Now, I shared a couple of weeks ago uh, what I thought about demon possession today and I, how I think it's slightly different in the time of biblical times. Now, there are people, some of you out there who have experiences that might be different than mine. You would, you would um, beg to differ. And I think there are rooms where Christians could differ. But what this passage here, first and foremost, is talking about the power and authority that Jesus gave to the apostles. And I would argue that by extension, it is given to us, even if it's to a lesser extent. For example, we do not have the same authority as apostles in the first century New Testament. Because... Scripture is done. None of us today can write scripture. Revelation tells us very simply that if anyone asks any words to the word of this book, God will add to him curses in his life. If anyone takes away from this book, God will take away his portion from the book of life. Now, There is that power. And in terms of healings, I would say as well that Christians today do not have the same authority as a power as the first apostle. I believe that their God may give someone the ability, more grace when they pray for some healing, that they will be healed. But this is something that God himself But these are included, we want to argue, by saying encouragement for Christians today. And we as Christians really need to think more the whole concept of authority. And this is not just something given to the, to the apostles. Jesus said at, at the end of Matthew, all authority on the heaven and heaven. Uh, and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So in some ways, Jesus has delegated that authority to us as believers to go out and preach the good news. Now, today, we can argue, um, we don't like the word authority. Because today, authority, the word authority is seen as a dirty word. Because when you see authority, you think this is something that's abusive. It is absolutely right that authority has been abused in the past, and, and we need to stop that. But authority is something that God himself delegates to his apostles, and by extension, to believers everywhere. In fact, God the Father, when he rules over this world, he rules with authority. You cannot get away from the whole concept of authority. Your father's here. God has given you authority in your homes. Your elders and other leaders, your deacons here, God has given you authority. And some of you serve in this civil realm, as we have teachers here, God has given you authority in class. So authority is something that God has given to run this world. 
It's just a question of whether we will have good or bad food. But here, oftentimes, the problem with us as Christians is that I believe the problem is so often we reduce the Christian life to just being nice, to being kind. And oftentimes our Christian life become reduced to just you get saved. And after you're saved, you have a whole life to do this. God has given you so much power in the life of the Christian. I think oftentimes it's like a smartphone, someone with a smartphone, you just push the on button and just see a nice picture that flashed on for 10 seconds. And then disappears. And to him, that's what the Christian life is all about. And he's unaware of the power that's harnessed by this machine called the smartphone. That's what God has given to you. In terms of authority. Now, in terms of power, I believe God's the spirit gives us power. And sometimes the Holy Spirit comes in power, especially at certain times in history. The founding of our nation, before the founding of our nation, there was a period of a great awakening, which really touched many people's lives. The Holy Spirit swept to the 13 colonies, and they, many people said as much as a third of the population was converted at the time. But this was really what made a lot of the Christian foundations in our nation. We need the spirit of power today in our lives. We need God's power. We need to see God's power in our lives to help us overcome sin and temptation. God is working. And he continues to work in our lives. Have you ever tasted that power? I love Philippians 4 19. It says that my God will supply all your needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I find it amazing that the Apostle Paul did not say, I will, I will, um, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Paul says riches in glory. There's something about the glory of God that we have not seen. It's not just riches, that God has abundant money that you can give to supply your need. God supply your needs so that you would see, say, wow, God is amazing. Scripture also tells us what? Come and taste that the Lord is good. It's not just come and know in your head that the Lord is good. It's to come and taste that the Lord is good. Okay, let's let's keep going here. Um, and he sent them out to proclaim in the kingdom of God and to heal. And here's what, what he says also to the disciples. Listen to this. He said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you may enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you have leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And here he says, um, we can summarize this, what he says about taking no staff. What is this? Why is it like no staff, no money, no bread, no bag, and don't have two tunics? Is that the standard of all, how all Christians are supposed to live? No. This is an example at this instance of how God sent his apostles to spread the gospel. But I believe there are principles that we can learn from this as far as what it means to serve God. When he, he says that, take no staff with you. Um, 
some people ask you to look at the Gospel of Mark and say, you know what? In Mark, they, Jesus tells them to take a stab. What's the de- what's the difference? Well, I believe what Mark is talking about when they talk about staff is a walking stick. It's okay to have a walking stick. But sometimes the staff could also be used as self-defense. And I think that's what, what Jesus is actually saying is that, you know, um, at this time, you don't need to take this, this big rod with you. You can take a staff with you. Then he says, Jesus says, you don't take a bag. No bread, no money. Why don't you take a bag? Well, those bags in those ancient times were actually for collecting money. And then what Jesus is saying that when you go out and preach the gospel, you're not about to just make collect money for yourself to make yourself rich. You are to go out just to tell people about him. That's why there's no call for money. See, at the end of the day, you know, sometimes today we get that confused. Money is not the reason that you go out and share the gospel. Money is not a motivation that you, why you go into ministry. Yes, we all need have our needs met. That's and the apostle talks about this, but he's warning against getting rich for ministry. And even you are to not bring bread, nor two tunics. He's saying to depend yourself absolutely on what God can speak. I don't know, have you ever gone to a time in your life, a a place where you actually absolutely have to trust God? You know, this past Friday, several of us had a chance to minister to the south side of Milwaukee. And we were armed with some sandwich bags. We passed around and we asked people if we could pray for them. And God opened some amazing doors for us to pray for different people. And there is even a young lady who was filled with tears, thankful for what people could do. And that's what it means, you know, to show the love of God to the people around you. And when Jesus further tells them that whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony. You know, in the ancient days when a Jew returned from a Gentile land, before he crossed the border into his own country, he would shake the dust off his feet to make sure he'd get rid of all the Gentile dirt from his feet before he comes in. But Jesus is saying something else. He's saying in the, among the people of God, the Jews, if they reject you, you shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against you. He's saying that he himself is the standard. Brothers and sisters, this is a good question for you and me. It's not just that you go to church all your life that makes you a Christian. It's not that you have the name Christian that makes you a Christian. Is Jesus truly Lord in your life? That is the question you have to answer. And this is a testimony. Jesus becomes the cutting point. Whether they accept him, this is the real reason that you are God's people. And here is this that the, the people, the apostle departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everyone. This is a commission that Jesus has us to do because we are to go on and spread the gospel everywhere as much as possible. And listen to exactly 
what happens next? Right here, is the story seems to change immediately because it went from the disciples to, the, to Herod. Verse 7 says, Now Herod the Tetra heard about all that was happening. And he was perplexed because he was said by some that John has raised from the dead. Now the question is, all these things, what do they refer to? The best way to take what it refers to is immediately what happened is that the disciples, apostles, went out and preached the gospel. And when they went out and preached the gospel, even the highest level of government heard about what Jesus was doing through the apostles. You see, Luke placed this passage here for a very specific reason. To show about the power that was true in Christians. That they shook the world upside down. This is what God's commission for us as believers. Now, of course, I don't think I need to say that it has nothing to do with you or being conscious. Spirit, but it's to realize that God has given us a task. It's hard to believe, but this, in a sense, this world we live in is a world at war. It's a battle between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. We know ultimately that the kingdom of God will win. As a fight. And that's why power and authority were given to the apostles. And again, this power and authority is given to you as well. Even if it's a small amount, you're called to give the message. And your Herod is perplexed. Now we know that Herod is a wicked man, and in the end, he will you will reject Christ, anyways. But even up to him, he heard Christians. Now this is a question that we need to ask ourselves: Am I making a difference? Am I? Is it said of me that people? The gospel. And you see this? He heard about what the apostles were doing, and he asked, Who is this Jesus? You see, ultimately, what we do, everything we do is to point people to Jesus. And may God give us the ability to do so. Now, I know I have to finish um, very quickly. I'm just going to jump to the feet. Let me say this real quick. There are a lot of ways we can look at the feeding of 5,000. I just want to look at one. Verse 10 tells us, and they returned the apostle told him all that he had done. And he took them and withdrew them apart to a town called the Sega. Now, Martin's gospel tells us that he took them because they needed rest. And, and Jesus um, and verse 11 tells us, when the crowd learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them, and spoke to them, the kingdom of God, and cured those who had healed them. Now, if you're an apostle, you had just ministered out there for such a long time. When you come back, you're tired. And when Jesus tells you that he's going to take you to a place of rest, you're very grateful. But the crowd came. Jesus continued to he not only minister, he welcomed them. He was just tired and they down. And he just kind of wanted people to leave. In fact, I think that's what happened. In verse 12. Now the day began to wear away, and the 12 came and said to him, Set the crowd away. Go in the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and provisions, for we are here in the desert place. 
you can hear between the lines that the disciples retired. They say, you know what, just send the people away. Just tell them to go away so we can have some R&R. &R. I love what Jesus said to them. You give them something. Now, did Jesus truly expect that they would have something to eat? Feed them. Five loaves, two fish. That would be like not knowing the laws of physics, right? Everyone taking a nibble and wouldn't go to 5,000 men, not even counting the women and the children. But Jesus um, Jesus said this for a reason. He wants to show that he can be. You know, one of the best challenges of you as a Christian is when you grow as a Christian, Jesus always challenges you. Sometimes when you serve him, And you think this is all you can do. In fact, you've done a lot. Jesus is always pushing. Now, this is not against rest and relaxation. God does want us to have rest and relaxation. But what he's saying is that he wants to challenge and give you more reason to trust. Him. This seems like an impossible situation. But what does Philippians 4.19 tells us? My God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. The riches of his glory. You see, he wants to take you to the next level. To have you trust in him and to have you grow in every way to know him. And then, will you, let me ask you, have you experienced this riches? Like that smartphone I mentioned earlier, it's your understanding of God, just like that, you turn that thing on. But you have a whole bunch of God's grace. The Lord says, well, come and taste. Let's Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Thank you so much for the riches and glory that you have given to us in Christ Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you may be glorified among us. In Jesus' name.